Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Moore. I'm the assistant site manager here at the James K. Polk State Historic Site in Pineville, North Carolina. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. And we're happy to welcome Tom Cole of the Charlotte Mecklenburg um, Library. And more specifically, you probably know him as uh, being one of the librarians from the Robinson Spangler Carolina Room, which is a great resource for um, local Charlotte history. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to him and for, um, I think there were a few people that have come in uh, since I mentioned it before, but we've got the Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen. If you click on that, you can enter any questions that you have as we go along and we can cover those at the end. Um, and if you have any general comments and whatnot, feel free to share those in the chat. But otherwise, I will hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you, Kate. I am uh, I'm really proud to be part of this series. The, 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 the Polk State Historic Site has done such a wonderful job in keeping itself and its mission before the public during this time of shutdown, as, as, even as we're moving out you know, of it. So uh, congratulations on that. And the, the, the talks in the series have been high, high quality. Yeah, um, it's been really so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, um, Anyway, as, as Kate mentioned, I'm Tom Cole, the Carolina Room. Um, one question I get all the time is, when will the Carolina Room be open again? Some of you may have, may have done genealogical research or other research there. And, and the answer is, mm, probably not for very long. Um, we, uh, at the, li the, the main library, Uptown Charlotte, will be uh, shutting down in October and demolished. They're gonna build us a new one. Uh, op opening in three, 2024, but for those three years, the Carolina Room will be in a kind of exile. So a lot of our time, even though our room is not, our room is not open to the public yet, uh, and it may open briefly before, you know, over the summer, but it will have to shut down at the end of the summer as we pack up, pack up things and head out to our new quarters. Um, anyway, so stay, you know, keep checking. If you really want to come up, there may be a chance this summer. Um, but now to the topic at hand, thank you all for um, uh, today and sharing this in my and you know, sharing the interest in uh, uh, this interesting, interesting woman who was in some ways illustrative of her times, in some ways really stepped out of her times and very few other uh, people, very few other women uh, could have done. And uh, so let's get to her story. I'm going to share my screen here. Yep, here we go. Oops. Sorry not to have this ready to go. Um, All right, 1803 to 1891. You know, born, I suppose the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase had just been acquired when she was born. And um, her, the middle of her life, we added to that with uh, land from Mexico, the United States did. And towards the end of her life, well, the, we hadn't yet added, uh, hadn't yet fought the Spanish, but we were coast to co a coast to coast nation by then, even with Alaska and Hawaii as territories by then. So, you know, a long life, an amazing span of change, lived through, um, uh, which we'll, we'll get to some of that. Um, so I'm going to talk first about uh, just the status of women in 19th century America. And just to set some context to appreciate how, how Sarah Polk, uh, Sarah Childress and Sarah Polk, uh, then Sarah Polk got done what she needed to, what she wanted to get done. And to under, the fundamental fact about uh, women's status in 19th century America and Western world generally was the idea of separate spheres. That the, it, it arose from the assumption that men and women have such different natures that their roles in the world, their duties uh, must, be, must be different. And um, uh, women, for instance, the men's world was the public world, the world of business and politics, 
I had someone told me once, tell me once in the Carolina rooms, we look up obituaries all the time. And so someone told me once, my mother said that a lady's name should only be in the newspaper when she's married or, and when she dies. <laughs> that is, that's, that's the view of separate spheres, that the newspaper is the, 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 the public world and that's not where a woman should be seen. Is that, um, that's the, and well, what can we say? That attitude, it has a long half-life. It's, it's the, and the women's world then was managing the household uh, teaching, you know, living up to ideals of, of piety and virtue, teaching and teaching them to that to the children. I, I like this this photograph because by reversing roles, it makes clear what what expectations we live under. Why does this look wrong to you? Because um, the picture hanging by the wall shows two women at the beach about to about to enjoy the surf. <laughs> um, 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 but the point of this for Sarah Polk and for all women of her time, is that to get, to get what they wanted out of the world, out of the men in their lives, they had to first acknowledge separate spheres and work within that. Um, and to not appear to be rocking the boat and challenging the paradigm, but to uh, behave in outward compl compliance with it, even while using the system for your own benefit. It was in a, in a society of superiors and inferiors, that's always the way. The inferiors, inferiors can't be direct. They have to get what they want by indirection. It's true of women, true for slaves in the South as well. Um, and the, well, so there's, you know, what, there are whole, whole courses on this, con on this concept. So I'm gonna stop there and just having made that point, I'll move on. We can get back to it if, if questions arise. All right, so the other context for her, a little more, a little closer, to, a little smaller context, is the context of first ladies. The, there have been 10 presidents before um, uh, James K. Polk was president. And, um, J, and Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson was a widower. And um, he, I think he had a niece or something in, 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 the, in the White House. Uh, or it was daughter. I'm sorry, I forget. But it's his. He ran the house, the White House, like a men's club. Um, so there wasn't really a first lady then. And um, you know, the the wife of William Henry Harrison never got past the probationary period, so of the first ladyship. So I'm not counting her. Um, but there are two, two. You know, the two that set the strongest example before uh, uh, before Sarah Polk were Abigail's there on the left and uh, Julia, excuse me, and um, uh, Dolly Madison there in the center. Um, one, um, one a rather prim New England matron there and Dolly Madison in her, I believe that's the an empire waist that she's wearing there, looking and smiling like Mona Lisa, just uh, that's a beautiful capture of her smile there. Um, a little more, a little, a little friendlier, a little more inviting. Um, of Abigail, John Adams said of her, he paid her an indirect compliment. He was talking about the British general during the Revolutionary War. He said, um, General Howe might have held Boston if he'd had a wife. And he knew the value of a smart wife. Abigail Adams was in some ways a sounding board, even sometimes when he didn't want her to be. Um, and there's, as, as anyone who's read that book or seen the, the TV documentary on it, theirs was a, 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 love, a long and loving marriage. Um, and two people who took duty seriously, this quote, learning is not attained by chance, it must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. This is a quote from Abigail Adams that is on one of the pillars outside the main library. And it gives you an idea, I think, of her, her sternness and seriousness. Um, Dolly Madison, through great parties at, um, at a time when Washington was still almost like a fraternity, very men kind of coming to town for the sessions of Congress and leaving their families behind. But she uh, feminized the social world somewhat, gave it, gave it a different, um, uh, you know, made it less competitive, made it a little more, uh, pol made it more polite. Um, Put these men, put these men on their best behavior, which he did, and um, 
And it was something she could do that the president could not, President James Madison, because for all his gifts, he was not um, a social director. And the great story about her that people love to tell, the thing that came to symbolize her to the American public was that as the British troops approached the city of Washington in 1816, um, and would, a city they would ultimately burn, um, that in, in retribution, and she fled the White House, but tore the portrait of George Washington from its frame before she went so that it would not suffer any depredations at the hands of the British. So there's an example of, of, uh, of her heroism. Um, Julia Tyler there is on the far right. Um, she's the wife of John Tyler, who, was, who took over from William Henry Harrison. And she was 24 years old. Uh, actually, she was, she was born in 1820. So I guess she was younger than that when she, mar when she married, she, she was his second wife. The big difference in age, a young woman as a first lady and she loved to dress in splendid gowns. She loved to throw lavish parties, lots of fun and dancing. And you know that she she tried to make the White House this this center of parties. So that was this is the context, the kind of distant context and immediate context for um, Sarah, Chil Sarah Childress Polk when she got to the White House. But before we before before we sit there, let's ask how did she get there? She got there from Tennessee. There's a map of Tennessee and it's new, when it's a new state, um, the blue areas are marked there as settlers land and the, uh, the red areas are the Indian land. Um, and she, uh, her family, Joel and Elizabeth Childress were in that blue circle of middle Tennessee, the blue uh, um, hemisphere, hemis semicircle of um, central Tennessee there. And the Polks would eventually move there too from Mecklenburg County in 1805, but the, the Childresses had come earlier. Um, there are not, not two things stick out about Sarah, Polk, Sarah Childress's childhood. She was one of four surviving children of six births from her mother. Her mother had her sixth child at age 28 and none thereafter. Only speculate as to the reasons why, but what's more important is that it meant that she and her sister and her two brothers grew up with a greater share of their parents' attention than they would have had if they had been part of the usual family of eight, nine, or ten that the neighbors had. I mean, if, if uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, Childress had gone on having children every two years, she would have had a lot more, si lot more siblings. Um, and her father was in this one way, and if not, if not, I mean, he was a Success, you know, canny land speculator and made himself a rich man in central Tennessee. Um, but what really set him apart was that he believed in women's education. Sarah and her sister, private training at the, at the home, he paid for that. And he paid to send them to an account, a, a private academy in North Carolina um, run by the Moravians, like that in Tennessee. And so Sarah, got the idea that she had potential and that she was being trained to do great things. And she took these, you know, not just to marry well, but to use her, I mean, she really believes she was there to use her education and her knowledge. Um, and this was a conviction that few other young women had the chance to develop in her time and place. Um, he died when she was still in, uh, still in that uh, boarding school, still in her teens. Uh, but had made his impression and had guided her, you know, sent her on a life path before then. Um, and Mother Elizabeth lived on until the 1870s or so um, and was, uh, was notable for being a strict Presbyterian. And Sarah, while not quite as strict as her mother, was stricter than, than most, as we'll see. Okay, she married James... Young, a long, young lawyer who was also serving as the uh, clerk to the state house, Nashville's capital of Tennessee. Um, and they, I, I, don't, I don't have a story about how they met, but you know, in a small world in Nashville and they moved in the same circle. Um, grab a book here, excuse me. And this is a picture of them late in life. Um, I love the fact that her arm is resting on his. 
Um, you don't see that too often in 19th century portraits. It's so often just side by side, but this, you know, they have the usual stone face that people have when they have to hold still for a long exposure. But I, I choose to read genuine affection into this, into this pose. Um, and mostly because it's confirmed by other aspects of their marriage. So that's what I mean by calling it a companionate marriage. A marriage that's not real, you know, it's not realized for dynastic purposes or not, um, not a marriage of, uh, uh, but a marriage held together by, by genuine affection. Um, and it was also a political partnership. Um, and the, I, I take a lot of, I take a lot of what I uh, say about, about um, uh, Sarah Polk from this new biography of hers called Lady First. Uh, by Amy Greenberg. It's published, I think, in 2017, but a very, um, uh, a very incisive book. Sarah Polk didn't leave many papers behind, and uh, Ms. Greenberg really has to get the most out of the materials that are left to her. Um, so she's, she can't look, she, you know, she can't psychoanalyze these two. <laughs> That's not what she wanted to do, but she can't really probe the inner motives of why they got married and what they saw in each other, because I suppose they knew and didn't, and they weren't saying. But, um, but so she puts a series of questions here about um, the Polks as a couple. Um, uh, okay, okay, okay. Well, actually, I'm going to skip the series of questions and get this, get to this paragraph. There's no question that some sort of understanding between James and Sarah Polk existed. Sarah was destined for greater things than the Polk cottage. She recognized James' political promise and pushed him forward. She shared his passion for small government and continued territorial expansion. She saw what he could do and what they could do together. James quipped that had he remained the clerk of the legislature, Sarah, quote, would never have consented to marry him. <laughs> it's, she didn't want a man who was going to keep him in little, little old Nashville. Uh, she wanted um, a man who was ready to do great things, um, be, not just to ride on his coattails, but to do great things with him, to make that, po to make that possible. Um, even though she would not be the public face of that achievement. The um, James K. Polk, I mean, I suppose here I am the, the Polk house um, virtually, and uh, I assume everybody knows about Polk, but I'll, I'll just say, yes, he, he, was, he was an extraordinary man in himself, uh, extraordinary one thing for surviving abdominal surgery as a youth to get rid of gallstones, uh, surgery which it appears left him unable to uh, to to um, sire children because he and Sarah never had children, um, and that's one spec that's one speculation as to why. Um, but so nonetheless, I mean, and the uh, he went on to go to Chapel Hill, and graduated as a young age, and become a lawyer and do and excel in his career in Tennessee. So. He was, uh, at, the, at the time of their marriage, 28 years old, he, he was going places, um, or at least had that potential. Uh, all right, and it mentions that Sarah Polk and James Polk were ideologically compatible. They saw eye to eye on the question of uh, small government, uh, that is, or states, to put it, the other, put it more uh, in a positive way, um, and territorial expansion because the South needed territorial expansion. Uh, slavery was the kind of practice that was always looking for fresh lands to exploit. Um, and uh, uh, Sarah, um, so Sarah Polk had, you know, her father owned slaves. She'd grown up among slaves, had, uh, no, had no qualms about the institution and sought to shape policy that would help it, help it expand. Um, and so as a practical matter, as a slave mistress, as someone who had control over human property, um, her, her behaviors reflects, I think, this value, this, these values that for her, as someone who is just the mistress of slaves, of slaves inside the house, um, 
slavery was a matter of interpersonal relations, of management, of, uh, um, you know, not so, not so much the whip and the lash inside the house as in the field. I mean, she's certainly that right. For, I, I, there are no accounts that she uh, ever resorted to corporal punishment, but you know, it wouldn't have been unusual if she had. Um, but the time, the things that are accounts of are times that she made extraordinary demands to, um, uh, for the benefit of slaves that had come in with her from the Childress family. These were her people. She made a distinction between them and those that had come in from the Polk side. Um, and she would intercede to, for instance, to make sure that families weren't separated by sale or that a man who had been sent to one plantation could be brought back, could be brought back to the Polk house so that, um, uh, so that the married couple could be together. And so she wanted to be her, she wanted to think of herself as a good, a good mistress, a good slave mistress. Um, as Frederick Douglass said, I never had a good master until I was my own master. Uh, but I think that that state, I don't think that statement would have occurred to her that uh, this is a painting here by the wonderful American um, artist Winslow Homer. This one is from the time of reconstruction. He visited the South after, after reconst during reconstruction and painted this one, which I'm sorry I've copied and made a little too yellow in putting it on the screen here. Um, the visit of the old mistress. And, you know, this is a painting that says a lot with just a little, with, with no, you know, the action isn't dramatic. It's just people looking at each other, different generations looking at each other. What do they see? How, what do they know of each other? It's just a painting with a million questions, um, but it does emphasize that kind of interpersonal side of slavery, especially of women um, governing um, the, uh, the, uh, the unfree servants within the household. All right, I'll move on. There she is, as a mature woman. Um, before she was first lady, she followed uh, James Polk to Congress. He was elected in 1825. That is the year after they were married, elected to Congress. And you know what's notable, he ran for Congress and nobody had heard of him much. And the, the incumbent was definitely the favorite. Um, but he traveled the length and breadth of the state of Tennessee canvassing and uh, getting to know people, you know, making himself known um, and convincing people that he would listen to them and stand up for them. So. To everyone's surprise, he got he was elected. He won. Um, so off he went to Washington and left his wife behind because that was the norm. That the families were one thing and and, and politics were another. Um, and after one term apart, you know, the Congress you know met met just a few months in in every year, and so he was spending most of his time in Tennessee, but. The, he didn't want her to travel, the roads were dangerous, this and that. And, but after one term apart, they never tried it again. Um, she was unhappy without him and he was not as effective without her. Once she was there, she showed her worth right away. She started a salon in their boarding house, a place where men come and engage in polite conversation. Um, as softening you know, people of different parties could uh, men of different parties and their and their wives could come up and she could make connections that would prove useful if he needed a, 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 an ally in some dis debate coming up. Um, in a few years, uh, I think by 1829, he had become Speaker of the House. This man was just out of his, just in his 30s. This man is rocketing to fame, but um, the. And then her connections became even more. She was, um, she, she could not only have these public settings with lots of people all getting along, whatever, but she was good at kind of buttonholing people, pulling them, pulling them aside from the crowd and saying, now, oh, Mr. So-and-so, um, how are you? And, and, and kind of engaging conversation and eventually getting around to something she needed uh, or something she wanted him to do and vice. And she, men, Men confided in her. The fact that she was uh, um, uh, well informed and serious, that they would confide in her. They treated her as an equal. Um, she was 
as we as I, you know, this is a point that Amy Greenberg makes often in her book that um, that she was publicly demure and but and in order to be privately effective. This is using the two spheres to her advantage. Um, that she couldn't be seen to be affecting change, but she could do it, as I tried to point out before, indirectly. Um, and let's see. Um, the, there was one Democratic Party rival to uh, of James K. Polk, who, who didn't like the president. The president, James K. Polk, another, he, another, he was a, you know, a lawyer. And um, I think he liked the law as a system of rules, something that's you know, either legal or illegal. And um, the, which meant that you know, some, you know, he's good in what's, he's, he was good with what's in black and white, but he wasn't so good with what was flesh and blood. You know? that James K. Polk could be stern and inflexible and not, not the kind of people, kind of person people warmed up to. Uh, where C. Polk was made ever made people feel welcome. And they, um, uh, so this one democratic rival who had, had between, between, him and, between him and Polk, there was no love lost, but he referred to um, uh, Sarah, Sarah Polk as quote, that fine, manly woman. I can't tell if you're laughing along with me. I don't see your faces there, but um, uh, that, that is to say that a fine woman and one who could, you know, hang in there and put and get her in, in, in politics as well as a man. Um, this is the kind of accomplishment that pe only people in your face-to-face -face circle recognize. That outside of that kind of in paper, on paper, what's in public, it would not be so obvious, which makes it hard to write her biography. All right, let's, move, let's move on. Um, so 1839, uh, the tide, the political tide is turning. I should say that, um, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I meant to say something about Adams and Jackson. It would really have to mention Jackson. Um, Andrew Jackson, a giant of American politics in the antebellum period, um, a, a transformational president. Um, that is, he served for two terms. I mean, he came in on a platform of change, served for two terms, and then his successor was of the same party. So that after two terms, people, people still bought into his vision enough to elect a successor. Uh, there are very few presidents who, whom you can say that. Uh, Jefferson was one. Um, uh, Jackson was another, two terms, followed by a successor in the same party, uh, Roosevelt and Reagan. So transformational presidents who, who uh, um, just changed the, changed the, changed the, the, the playing, uh, the, the, the way we talked and changed political goals and what we talked about politics. Um, but Polk was a Jacksonian through and through. That was his. That was his political stamp. I think that's why he was nominated president because they had a deadlock, and someone said, "Well, let's vote for someone who's a safe Jacksonian that'll carry that, we'll try to ride that reputation to another victory in 1844." Um, so, um, but the tide was turning at the end of the Martin Van Buren administration, the one who followed Jackson. He wasn't. There was an economic uh, depression. He wasn't popular. And rather than to lose his speakership or an election, he returned to Tennessee, Polk did, and ran for governor. Um, so what's her role? There's a whole chapter in this book called communications director, because that was her role during his, um, during once again, when he traveled the length and breadth of the state of Tennessee. And she handled correspondence. She wrote letters in advance to where he was going to make sure things would be ready. She wrote letters to newspaper, friendly and unfriendly newspaper letter editors to uh, try to get set the story straight. And in generally, generally smoothing his way, uh, ruffling, fe excuse me, not ruffling feathers, feathers, smoothing ruffled feathers. And, um, uh, being, you know, making sure that he had less to worry about as a candidate. Um, 
because besides just the rigors of travel, he had his health. So, you know, Polk, whether as a, as a result of that surgery or not, was always in delicate health, uh, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal issues throughout his life, um, which, uh, you know, maybe contributed to that sour, sour face he showed people. But, uh, but so his accomplishments are even more remarkable. He had an iron will. He could make himself do things. Um, and she was, as I say, communications director. And once he was in the governorship, she was, she didn't have a salon in, in, in Nashville. It wasn't the role of the first lady so much as it's the role of a congressman's wife. But Nashville, just as, as you see, 6,900 people in it, um, wouldn't be much of a, a, a diversity in the salon there. It's see the same old faces again and again. Um, anyway, be, but she hands full as the governor's wife, the first lady of Tennessee, because he, she was the person who was most loyal to him, whom he trusted the most, and who worked hardest for him. So he kept her at work. There's correspondence during this time from President Polk signed by him in her handwriting. So she might, you know, she's writing letters for him and, um, uh, and you know, consulting on things. It, it, he, it's only a two year term as governor. He was out in 41, didn't win again, didn't win again in 43. His political career is kind of on the rocks. And um, she, uh, she was no longer the wife of someone in office in those, those years of the early 1840s. And that quote at the end comes from a letter that period that their house though did not have, there were no children of their own in the house, had lots of visitors, most of them family. And she said, it has made me nothing more than a servant, which, you know, I, I suppose she just, if she saw the irony in that, that she protested at playing the role, role that she made, that others had no choice but to play. Um, if she saw the irony in that, she, she uh, suppressed it. Or maybe she didn't see the irony in that. Uh, uh, there's a quote from, um, from James Polk got her saying that, she, that once from their study as she observed workers in the field, she, she reflected on the different lot of uh, the, the men and women toiling in the sun and herself uh, and the president at his desk writing and herself at his service. And she said, said that no one would choose that law, just as I have not chosen this one. Therefore, she saw, it, she saw it as ordained by God. We must be meant for these roles, that society must have these ranks. We are here to fill this one. It's not our job to question it, but just do our, our, our tasks within these ranks in a, in, a, you know, in, a, uh, in a way that would be pleasing to our, the maker who has put us here. Well, that's... I'm sure you could come up to count with counter arguments to that. I won't attempt to myself. I'll just say that for understanding her, yeah, I think that that's a, a key insight. <clears throat> so first ladyship, eight, election 1844, dark horse candidate, he wins. Cut to chase, he wins. How does she act as first, as first lady? Because there are now different demands on her than as the governor of his wife in Tennessee. Um, it's, Washington is fuller, it's bigger, it's an international scene now, there are ambassadors and things. How does she um, use her interpersonal skills to promote, to make his presidency a success? And the first answer was lots of parties, but not parties in the way that Julia Tyler gave parties, which was, you know, um, Laugh, which, which, which would have had, although her parties would have had plenty of hard liquor and the punch and card playing at tables and dancing for the young couples. You know, that's not her, that wasn't Sarah Polk's way. And partly of course, because of her Presbyterian convictions, but also because it was just impractical. All that, that activity, the liquor, the card playing, the, the dancing didn't seem to her to have the, um, it didn't seem as useful to her. Whereas polite sociability based on conversations seated around a table, drinking wine, there was wine at their table, if, no, if not hard liquor. Um, uh, that she thought could be politically advantageous. That wouldn't be a waste of her time. So what, um, she was really lucky to have in Washington at this time, uh, Dolly Madison. 
the wife of James Madison, who himself had died in 1832, so here we are 15 years later, and uh, uh, she, uh, Mrs. Ma the widow Madison is still in town, um, but people loved her. Uh, I mean, I can't think, I, I can't think of a good example of another first lady who stayed in Washington and be, was remained the object of affection that way. I mean, I guess you can think of first ladies for whom, affection for whom lasted beyond their presidencies, um, their husband's presidencies. Uh, someone like um, uh, Betty Ford, you know, or Michelle Obama, uh, and uh, Ro Rosalind Carter. I think maybe maybe it wasn't quite so public a figure as those two. Anyway, that's the dis discussion for afterwards. Um, so. The photograph down there is a daguerreotype taken outside the White House. And there is President Polk with his hand, his, his left hand, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, coming out of his jacket, it seems to be draped, whatever, he's holding his, holding his jacket. Uh, Sarah Polk next to him with the, uh, um, the, the, the trim and various family members and James Buchanan is back there too with his niece. But to the president's, to James Polk's, to his right is Sarah, to his left is Dolly Madison. Um, and, you know, she's the one, I think, who um, had forgotten that this newfangled invention of the camera required her to sit, to stay perfectly still. She must have moved a little bit to blur the picture. I mean, um, if she were, if she were on a Zoom call, you'd have to tell her, oh, Mrs. Madison, you're, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get used to things, but I'm just delighted to have a picture of her at all. Um, and it shows wh what an intimate she was in the White House. There she is with family members and a cabinet member. Uh, James Buchanan was particularly loyal to, the, to, uh, to Sarah Polk. Um, all right. And Dolly Madison gave her, some, you know, cultivating that friendship gave her instant cred in Washington. Oh, so about all these parties, one important thing to mention is that the president hardly attended these. It may be at the beginning, but then he'd excuse himself. And after a little while, when, when she had talked to people she needed to talk to, the first lady would excuse herself because she had work to do with the president. <laughs> they had to go over the schedule for the next day, the papers to be signed, the things to be, the, the the, the means to be to be made all this all this had to be agreed upon and late at night when the other when others you know when the others are are um, sipping wine and not dancing that um that was their time for doing this all right so the, the president polk's uh four years in office is dominated by the mexican war uh, which he sought and um and which ended finally in, in victory. Um, but he and the first lady both, this was the right thing for the country to do. Mostly I think because it's good for the South. The South needed new lands because um, as lands get less productive, um, the cotton wears out the way they were, the way they um, tilled the land, it was it wore it out quickly, wore out its productivity and um, less productive lands means less work, well, not as much for, uh, not as uh, less returns. And um, they had made big investments, especially in, in, in uh, not so much in land, but in, in, in slave labor. And these investments had to, um, had to, uh, you know, get, had to earn a return. So new lands in, um, in the, uh, new lands in Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, Arkansas, all these, th all, you know, each of these booms successively kind of reviv revived um, uh, the health of the slave economy in the South. Um, broadening the base of the old union, that's a bit of an obscure phrase. I mean, what I mean by that is that it would have, like, the, it would have just increased the size of the country, may, and, and, but not changed the country. They believed in the old union of you know, largely self-government, largely self-governing states with the federal government that was responsible for defending the frontiers and, and delivering the mail and maintaining diplomatic relations. Um, so um, <clears throat> that's the Jacksonian view of the role of the federal government. And that's the old union that, um, 
that they wanted to strengthen and expand. The war turned out to be more difficult. I mean, the Mexicans had been weakened by, uh, before the war with the United States by Indian war, and there was internal dissension within, this, within the country. But nonetheless, it took almost two years for the United States to, for, the, for Mexican, Mexico to surrender and to offer a deal. Uh, which President Polk accepted. He might have held out for something better. He might have wanted better when the war started. But by this time, he realized that every week the longer that the war lasted in 1848 was more and more damaging to the Democratic Party's chances in the upcoming election. Um, he, had even, he had said that he would only serve one term, um, which whatever, he, he thought that that offer would, um, would unite the party somehow. That if, if there were people divided, divided again, if there were people against him, that they could find someone new to coalesce around whom to coalesce. Um, but uh, that, um, but not, so nonetheless, he was determined to see the war to a successful conclusion within his presidency and uh, did that with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which added tremendously to the country, uh, subtracted tremendously from Mexico. And um, you know, made, made California a state until, you know, California was, was being eyed, in, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm questioning how much into the national history to go here. Uh, let me just say that um, at the time of the Mexican War, Ralph Waldo Emerson from Concord, Massachusetts, observed it and observed what was going on and said, Mexico will poison us. Whereas the South thought they couldn't survive without fresh lands. The North believed that the Union couldn't survive with fresh lands, that the debate about who was going to, who was going to, um, whose way of life was going to predominate in those new lands would inevitably lead to conflict. And um, indeed it did. That was certainly not what the Polks intended, but uh, the, uh, the internal, the, the, the clash of interests within the Union proved stronger than the, the geographical unity of the Union on the map. Um, so, so the war's over, the election happens, uh, a Whig, Zachary Taylor, general from, uh, from war was elected and Polk goes home. The Polks go home, uh, but not right away. They do a kind of tour through the South first because their home in Nashville, which he had bought while in office, was still kind of under construction. They're waiting for the contractors to finish everything. And it's, it's, it, it, she kept getting, Sarah Polk's mother kept writing her letters saying, oh, come home, please don't travel. There's cholera in the United States. 1848 was a year of cholera epidemic. And um, the, um, there was cholera in some of the places they visited, they even, one of the one of the slaves they brought with them suffered from it, but she survived. Um, and something, well, they arrived back in Nashville. The president worn to a frazzle, and um, from the because everywhere he went in the in the southern states, at least people wanted to cheer him and hear him speak and all this and that. So <clears throat> he spends a lot of time in bed when he arrives back home in, in I guess it would be April or May. Um, in Nashville, and dies. Let's just put, uh, you know, we don't know exactly why he died in June. So he was, he had three months out of office before dying. And that's why my next chapter is widowhood. 1849, at age 46, Sarah becomes a widow and she lives another 42 years. Um, but think of it, she was always worried about his health, but probably always told herself, oh, he'll be all right. We, I have more time with him. Uh, but just like her father, suddenly the most important man in her life is taken from her when the relationship is in full vigor. You know, before, before she, uh, not, not when, you know, not when, not, not at any time, but um, she kept the room, his rooms in the house exactly the same, his papers, his pens, and you know, she kept it clean as if he might walk in the next moment. Um, one thing that's new about widowhood for her, and 
I mentioned that women have these separate spheres. Legally, that separate, the separate, uh, legally women had very limited rights in marriage. It was a doctrine known as coverture. And the only financially independent women were either those who had never married or widows. And, and um, our, my, uh, Kate's written about the, the independent business women of uh, antebellum Charlotte. Um, and the, but suddenly she's a widow which means she's not just part of a team, she's responsible for everything, including the business side of slavery, making decisions about, do we sell people? Can we afford to get new people? Um, she, I, I don't believe they bought any new slaves under her terms. But also she has to decide what kind of rations do they get? How much can I afford to set aside for, uh, for, um, for their well-being? And how much do I count on their being worked to within an inch of their lives to produce the profits I need to pay off my debts. Um, you know, the actual, the actual um, punishment that brought her enslaved workers to within an inch of their lives and the hard routine that was demanded of them was that was governed by the overseer. She wasn't, you know, she didn't, she didn't uh, uh, bring the whip down on anybody, but it was done in her name. And she, I, she had to, she had to make decisions about selling, selling people off too, even, even breaking up families. Um, that's the business side of slavery. And it's not, it's not just the, the pretty paternalistic side of, uh, you know, looking after your people. That's the, that's the message of Uncle Tom's Cabin too. I don't know if she ever read that. That'll be a good question. Um, she wasn't politically, you know, just picture that, just picture her I, 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 I was preparing to say myself, here she had devoted herself to her husband's success and suddenly this great object in her life is gone. But I think that's a misstatement. Um, as I thought, the more I thought about it, she wasn't, you know, I, I read that paragraph from before because she wasn't just devoted to her husband's success. She believed that the two of them together could achieve more than either one of them alone. That the two of them could affect the course of United States history. The two of them could help make the South stronger. The two of them could um, um, bring the Union together with a successful war. That, that was, <clears throat> um, and so her mourning is not just a mourning for the loss of James, but for the loss of Sarah and James, the loss of that, that, that personal and political partnership. Um, and um, she wore, famously, she wore black. She stayed in mourning the rest of her life. Um, but a year or two must have just been crushing depression. Um, the, the, but she, she eventually began to move about a bit more. Um, was seen more outside the house, except, except I mean, besides going to church, which she never gave up. But, um, and it's a good thing that she recovered some of those social skills um, while all the time reminding the world that she was Mrs. James K. Polk as she signed all her letters the rest of her life. Um, but because when the war came, when the Civil War came, um, Long story short, Tennessee was the first state to fall to the Union forces. And so as early as 1863, three, um, two, two, 62, um, federal forces were in Nashville. Nashville was, an, was a conquered city from their point of view or a liberated city from the point of view of the Union generals who came there. And so as a prominent person in, in Nashville, um, she had an opportunity to use her powers uh, for her own good, of course, and for the good of the city, and which involved negotiating with, talking to these union generals, making sure that they felt welcome in her home. She flew the American flag, not the stars and bars. Once they were there, she flew the American flag outside her home. 
And so much so that Southern papers wrote disapprovingly of her. I mean, these are, you know, don't need to tell you, extremely polarized times so that any, anything less than total commitment to one cause or the other seemed like disloyalty. So she got criticism from Northern and Southern papers during, during and after the war uh, because she tried to walk this fine line of uh, ingratiating herself to those who could help her while um, remain, you know, while uh, remaining a, a Southern woman and remaining true to her, her loyalties uh, that way, uh, even though she, I mean, she was a Southern woman, but she was never a secessionist. Um, so as, as that's, um, but it, there are many reports from Union soldiers in Nashville that she would be outside the house and welcome them in and speak kindly to them and, and say, I, or as, as she said to one of them, I'm on my way to a meeting I cannot miss. Uh, I'm at a point a meeting I cannot miss, but you are welcome to go into the house. The servants know, are familiar with visitors and they will show you around. <laughs> Mi casa es su casa. What a thing to say. Um, um, I, have, I doubt very much she said it in Spanish, but, um, the, but it's funny, one of the things she had in that house was a portrait of Cortes the Spanish, uh, the Spanish conquistador, which had been looted from Mexico and brought to her as a trophy, and uh, presented to her as the, you know, and, and to President Polk as as the new Cortes, the new conqueror of Mexico, um, and that I believe is still in the Polk House. Um, anyway, so there she is at the end of her days. You know, uh, the uh, no one looks their best in the daguerreotype because you have to, you know, keep that. that it's quiet, um, that it's the relaxed face and to hold still for so long. Um, and, but by this time, the 1870s or 80s, when this, when this picture was taken, they had moved beyond the daguerreotype. I'm sure they had things that required slower exposure, I mean, faster exposure times, but still, I think this reflected her mood, somber. Uh, you can look at her and imagine what thoughts are going on in her head. Um, is she thinking of her nieces and nephews and what they need? And because their family members lived in the house with her until the end. Um, is she thinking what might have been? Um, is she thinking of um, presidential politics, what she read in the paper that morning? It's, you know, um, any of those things is possible. Um, but she is a remarkable a, a woman who's illustrative, illustrative of her times, but also illustrative of what could be done in spite of those times, in spite of the expectations of a woman. As long as she had, um, you know, the, the strengthening of the ch of childhood that she had, the strengthening, encouraging childhood, and a, a life partner who, for the time they were together, uh, took her seriously and really, really treated her as a partner, worked her as a partner, work she was willing to do. So um, I'm going to stop the, the screen here, stop the sharing of the screen here, um, and return to, all right, thank you. Uh, let's see how the Q&A has gone. Uh, partners, it would seem one equal to her ambition. Indeed, indeed, yes. The, they were both Slytherins, <laughs> if, I, if I can put it that way. Um, and we did have a question uh, kind of early on from Eric who asked, um, prior to their marriage, um, did Sarah uh, work as a, a teacher or um, kind of have any uh, other outside of the home um, type ambitions before marrying? No, she married at age 20. So, uh, I mean, she could have been a teacher, uh, but you no, know, she went back home. And I, I suppose her role was to help her mother run the house. Um, From the um, little bit that I've seen, I know she had several brothers and sisters and um, it seemed like to some degree she was kind of a sort of a linchpin between all of them and the mother. And, um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about her position as, um, you know, a, a slave mistress. And I think 
that must have been something even before her marriage within her own family because we have some letters and things of uh there were some enslaved people from her mom's household who ran away to try and get to where Sarah was um, and where some of the other you know, family members of theirs had gone to Sarah to her wedded home. Uh, so it seems like she kind of held a, a position even with the enslaved that were back at her, her mother's home where they kind of saw her as an yeah. arbiter. Well, as, as I said, anyone in a society of superior and inferiors, inferiors have to understand the system to get, make it work for them. So the slaves had to know who was the, who was the linchpin, you know, <laughs> who could get things done for us if we if we could possibly influence her. Yeah, um, we see that with the Polks too. Uh, here's a question from uh, Jean Downs. Thank you, Jean. Um, did she have any relationship with her successor? Actually, it's her predecessor as first lady, Julia Tyler. Uh, oh yeah, you got you got it. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Excuse me for complaining for correcting what you what you did yourself. Um, not that I know of uh, I, that the Tylers returned to Virginia after because frankly Washington. I mean Nashville. I made fun of Nashville being small, just sixty nine hundred people, but Washington was pretty small too. Um, a British ambassador there in the this is later near the time of the Civil War said talked about how undeveloped he says he said one. Minute they shoot grouse within sight of the White House. <laughs> the woods, you know, kind of went up to there. Anyway, um, but so they went, the Tylers went back to Virginia and they were different generations um, and different, different outlooks on life. I, I can imagine that uh, the, the, this book, The um, Lady First, quotes a few kind of, uh, um, see, remarks from Julia Tyler about how the, how the, uh, the there's no dancing anymore at the White House, and, and things aren't aren't like they were in the good old days when she was, in, when she you know, led the parties. Um, so that's my. Um, are you interested in? The, uh, well, so that's. Yeah, that's that's my that's my answer to that question. I don't think she leaned on Julia Tyler for assistance, and um, now she, not when she had Dolly Madison. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, no, no, go away. Sorry, I'm moving my mouse around. And things are popping up against my against my will. Oh, all right. Sorry about that, Tom. That's all right. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Jane with a comment on ab one equal to her ambition. Yeah, that's, I certainly see it that way. Um, Jefferson's daughter, thank you, that's right, because Jefferson's famous for writing these moralistic letters to his daughter. Because <laughs> his wife, you know, his wife died young and he was, I don't think he was entirely comfortable with the role of raising a child. Um, and um, now and you had Eric, briefly. Uh, I, you briefly mentioned that you know the Polks did not have any children, but I believe Sarah kind of took some uh, at different times, some different family members as you know yeah. kind of adopted yeah. children. There were there were always nieces and in, and and nieces in law from her point of view from the Polk side as well among them, and some were more welcome guests than others. Some proved. Um, now, sometimes a family would send a, an incorrigible boy to stay with the Polks, hoping that he would straighten up and fly right. And uh, one one young man was, you know, kept getting demerits in boarding school. And James Polk would write him letters about the the duty of, you know, living up to your name and this kind of thing. Um, and later on, a nephew on her side, I believe, stayed with, uh, who was they um, who who was raised. A lot uh, was raised a lot by them because of the death of his parents. Um, later went on to hold some office of trust in Tennessee and to be arrested for embezzling funds. This happened when um, you know long after the president had died, but it must have been just mortifying to her to think that he had brought this shame on the family. But 
Oh, well, wow. they're they're uh, you know they they had uh, I can see why they would have had a, a lot of nieces and nephews because all of all of Polk's brothers, other than one, all died in pretty much the the same year. Yes, and uh, but some of his surviving brother, uh, you know, in Nashville, right before Polk was elected to president, he shot a man in a duel. Um, so you know, there there's plenty of um, debate mm -hmm. about what what kind of family name. <laughs> they had really in Tennessee. But. Joel, Joel Childress, her father, killed a man in some business dispute. And, but I mean, the Tennessee. I think it, 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 it yeah. speaks to, yeah, Tennessee is like the uh, what, Wild West. Wild basically. West, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All but, right. Any last questions? I've got a. wrap up and make sure we got everything I think. All right. And as I mentioned, um I'll try to have this uploaded today. So um Great. that'll be on our, our Facebook um as well as our other social media. Uh I will mention before we go the site itself here is open if you'd like to come um, visit the exhibit. Um, oh, good. we have a, a a video that we play every 30 minutes that'll give you a little bit more biography on um, Polk side of things. And on Saturdays, we do have tours right now uh, at 11 a.m. and at 2 p.m. So you can uh, register for those ahead of time. They are a limited number, of course. Um, but other than that, um, Tom, did you have any? I'll be sure when I post the the picture, I'll link to the Carolina room. And uh, as you mentioned, that's kind of the best way for the foreseeable future for people to um, access that information. And you guys are have always been very uh, quick and diligent with your your email responses. So uh, Thank you. I'm sure mm -hmm. that's even more so true. And when you're not also serving patrons in person. <laughs> Right. Dividing. Little else to little else to occupy our time, but these email queries. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. So we've been getting a lot of real estate questions lately. People want to know what's the history of my house, where people were searching a property for commercial reasons, saying, I need to know what was this property here before. And and anyway, this is research they usually would come to the room and do, but um we put a let me put in a plug if anyone's interested in in the history of your home or your neighborhood. There's a site that Tom Hatchett and, and Mike Moore developed and with, with some input from me, um, it's called the Charlotte History Toolkit. Um, and I think it's, I think the Charlotte, uh, I think it's just charlottehistorytoolkit.org, but Google that phrase, Charlotte History Toolkit, and you'll get um, a great introductions to how to use public records to research, to, to do kind of micro history, the history of your, house or your block or your neighborhood. Yeah, I I will vouch for that. I remember uh, when they had first put it out, it was right around when I had purchased my house in West Charlotte, an old mill house. And I used some of the links they had to find some of the old records and whatnot for my house. So yeah, with, with the booming uh, real estate economy in Charlotte, I'm sure there are lots of people I'm not mm -hmm. interested in in that. Hopefully. <laughs> awesome. All right. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. And we hope you guys enjoyed. Feel free to let us know if you have any questions afterwards. Um, you can uh, comment on our Facebook or send us an email at pulse at ncdcr.gov.